Welcome to the lecture of uh, Elective in Robotics and Control Problems uh, in Robotics, devoted to uh, locomotion and haptic interface. And today we will uh, present and discuss uh, the second platform that has been developed within the Cyberwalk project. So, uh, you may remind that we have seen in the previous lecture the so-called uh, cyber carpet, the ball building platform with uh, non-alonomic constraints, and we have uh, described uh, its construction, uh, design, um, modeling, and control. And then we have seen a, a number of experiments. This platform uh, remained in the project as uh, only a small scale, a small scale prototype for a number of technological reasons. So uh, the project went on by uh, taking the road of a omnidirectional design. In fact, we end up with a full-scale 2D platform where the walker could walk uh, in an unconstrained fashion in any direction. But uh, in between, we also uh, acquired a one-dimensional linear treadmill this was a commercial one, specially designed in terms of length and width, as you can see in the top figure on the right, uh, on which we tuned uh, our motion control of the platform, with the idea that we could do the same when we move from one-dimensional to two-dimensional. So we will start uh, by a description of how the 2D platform uh, was built, what were the mechanical challenges, uh, which were the problem in terms of uh, control and so on. But before doing this, uh, let me uh, remind what were the control specification common to any platform within the project. So the idea is to uh, allow unconstrained motion of a user immersed in a virtual uh, world. Uh, in all cases, we decided to have a, a head-mounted display um, wo worn by the user. So, um, uh, the idea was uh, to let him walk in this uh, remote world, real or virtual that it may be, uh, while not leaving the room in which uh, the user was walking. So, standing on the platform, the platform should counteract, counterbalance any intentional motion of the user so to keep the walker more or less in the center, close to the center of the platform. We will see that, in particularly for this second platform, this idea of uh, not bringing the user exactly to the center uh, had some particular interest. Uh, as we said, the, there was no, no interest in orientation of the walker, uh, we already commented on that, uh, whatever we do with motion control of the platform, we should keep into account that there's a human user on top of it, and we should allow uh, comfort to um, his walking, so we have perceptual limitation to be taken into account. Essentially, this transforms itself into the requirement of smoothly controlled motion, uh, especially in the phase where we start and or we stop, because in that case, the acceleration is quite large, and this was also the reason why for this larger platform, in order to not make it too large in a sense, uh, we have also included a, a strategy of recentering uh, the um, set point where the user should um, uh, be brought. Uh, we have measurement about the worker position, so we will use in this case uh, uh, a Vicon system, not a simple uh, camera mounted on top of the platform, um, essentially because we are, we are able to use the same system to localize the user and also to localize the posture of the head, which is an information that is being used for visualization in the head-mounted display. Uh, we may use also some information about walker orientation. We did not use this in the beginning, and uh, what is unknown is the intentional walker motion. Uh, in the previous platform, we have designed 
uh, a disturbance observ observer at the velocity level. Uh, in this case, we will uh, develop something along the same line for all the quantities that are unknown. Uh, one major difference is that uh, this platform has a much simpler uh, kinematic model, but uh, because of the actual motion of a human on the platform, we decided to start directly a design at the acceleration level, so using acceleration as command. So we need to estimate also some information that uh, is not available at the level of uh, first order system. And last but not least, as I said, uh, here we will see the really relevant problem of uh, interfacing with uh, uh, virtual reality visualization and synchronization of motion control commands with update of the visual part uh, on the head mount and display of the user. So, uh, how was the platform, the final platform design? We, we have seen in, uh, in the introduction that the idea of a torus treadmill uh, was already there, developed by uh, the um, laboratory of Professor Ivata at Tsukubo University in Japan, uh, and also some other, uh, some other uh, researcher in, in the US, more uh, related to some um, military end user. So the idea of having, in fact, a number of treadmill mounted on top of a chain that provides the missing direction of motion. So this idea was already there, but within the Cyberwork project, we improved in many aspects the mechanical design. We designed completely from scratch the controller. Uh, also, the localization was made according to a um, a different system, and uh, very important, the visualization part was integrated in the whole project, which was not present neither in the in the um, what we know about the um, platform from uh, U.S. nor in uh, in Ivata uh, activities. So, uh, and apart from that we decided also to have a very large platform because we wanted to limit the perceptual effect so we need space in order to allow with lower acceleration to recover the intentional motion of the user without risking to come to the border of the platform itself so eventually uh, it was decided for a modular design in fact the development of the platform went through let's say, an intermediate prototype phase, although the whole duration of the project, of the construction of this platform was only two years, so not much really for a research project, but it was built uh, in a modular way so that the main idea and the tuning of uh, components, especially the choice of components from the mechanical, electromechanical point of view, could be made uh, on a reduced number of treadmill, eventually the full platform end up with 25 treadmill bells, which are along the direction where this uh, humanoid, let's say, or representation of a human is walking, while those platforms are mounted on a chain which provide the orthogonal direction of motion. We'll see now how this is really uh, set up. In doing the, uh, the design, there were many specification and also uh, different aspects that were desired by a possible end user. Uh, on, the left hand, uh, on the left hand side picture uh, you can see uh, Martin Schweiger, a PhD student of the Technical University of Munich, the mechanical part, who was the actual designer of the platform, who's um, walking on a commercial treadmill. Uh, it's a commercial treadmill which was uh, built by an external company, but upon some specification given uh, by the uh, research group. In particular, pay attention to the fact that this single treadmill, there will be 25 out of this, uh, contains uh, a major treadmill and a small side treadmill. They will be actuated in a 
synchronous way so that uh, and there's a reason for having divided the, the, the full treadmill in this small part and a, a large part. We will come back very soon on this. On the right hand side you see the empty final platform and there are different color specification. I gave a color uh, a different meaning. For instance, the dark brown uh, terms are really uh, design constraint or a characteristic, desired characteristic that we like to have from a mechanical point of view. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, from the structure, everything is mounted on a frame and we require the frame to be very stiff so that we can decouple any vibration induced by the motors from vibration induced by uh, any user moving on top of the platform. Uh, another aspect is uh, the height of uh, this structure. Uh, in fact, in the final collocation at the uh, Cyberneum in the Max Planck Institute in, in Tübingen, uh, this platform was mounted below uh, a wooden uh, floor so that uh, would disappear. So its total height is also relevant how much things you can place below. Uh, we wanted enough friction at the contact between the, the, um, uh, the belts of the treadmill uh, being actuated by some uh, actuator which is below and also on top so that you cannot sleep on this uh, treadmill. One particular request, um, and this is very important if you compare the original Torus design, which didn't have this, uh, this aspect, in order to avoid beads when the uh, sequence of uh, treadmill reach the end of the top surface or come back on the top surface from below, uh, we would like to avoid any hard contact from one uh, treadmill to the next one, side by side, and this was the reason for dividing this in, into parts with a small supporting um, part that accommodate better uh, while the whole chain is rotating at one of its end. We will see a video on that which is more clear. There are uh, other aspects which are important. Of course, thermic analysis is relevant if we would like to use this for sometimes. Um, the green terms are instead still uh, specification that we like uh, for the, let's say, comfort on top of the, of the platform. Uh, natural ground feeling, so we would like not that this long, in fact, five meter long treadmills uh, bend under the weight of the user so that you have a natural solid ground feeling under your feet, so surface stiffness. We would like that the whole chain has an endless rotation because you don't know if the worker is going to walk in one or the other direction continuously, forever, in a sense. So you don't want to have a, a stop there. Uh, the close vicinity, or I would say gap-free condition between uh, uh, treadmills that are side by side, so there's no hole uh, to uh, stumble uh, for the feet of the user. And of course, this, all this requirement puts also constraint on cabling, how you bring uh, supply to the various uh, components and motors, how you collect information from a sensor that may be placed below and so on. Uh, the red part instead is more related to the motion control. In fact, motion control, how we design the command for the chain part as well as for the individual treadmill. How do we coordinate all this treadmill in such a way that if the user is placed across two side-by-side uh, -side treadmill, they have exactly the same velocity. This is a matter not only of the algorithm of control, but also on equation. So there's a decision that had to be made at the beginning whether uh, we prefer for moving the uh, single treadmill an electrical or a hydraulical uh, 
actuation with related supply, what type of actuation is used for the, the chain, how many motors do we place, place uh, on the structure for moving the chain, let's say, left and right, in this, in this picture, and so on. And finally, some more general aspect, uh, say global aspect, the size, the weight, we ended up with a very heavy structure, more or less 10 tons, 7.5 of which were in motion. So the energy consumption is another, uh, is another constraint. Uh, and then how does this communicate with the rest of the world with uh, uh, um, information technology infrastructure which provides immersion in the virtual reality? So all this communication protocols and, and, and uh, uh, information exchange uh, needs to be taken into account in the overall design. So eventually uh, the limitation that we had or that were found to be satisfactory were that each of the 25 individual treadmill had a maximum velocity of 1.4 meter per second. In fact they could reach also 2 meter per second but this was uh, a conservative figure, enough for our purpose, and an acceleration uh, of uh, la larger than one meter per second squared. While uh, in the other, other direction, the principal chain, uh, we had the same maximum velocity, of course, because uh, in general we could also move in a diagonal fashion uh, or uh, rotate from one direction to 90 degree direction, while moving in straight line, uh, so we would like to keep the same maximum velocity, uh, and the acceleration is lower. In fact, in this direction, the, the, the platform is even longer, about 6 meters, while uh, 5 meters is on the side. So these are the general design specification and characteristics. Let's see some details, in particular how things were assembled. But one thing which is important, and this is a main change, in order to avoid the beating when the treadmill, uh, sorry, when the chain reaches its end and should bring the uh, individual treadmill from top to the bottom or vice versa. So the, this profile is not circular. It was decided to combine uh, uh, pieces of um, uh, profile in such a way that curvature is continuous. So we go from the linear side, let's say, on top of the, of the treadmill. Uh, this is a linear surface, so zero curvature. And at some point, we will get to a, a circular profile, uh, which a curvature is 1 over the radius, so 1 over r. In between, there are two clotoids, which have continuous change of curvature from 0 to 1 over r. So that the overall profile, while turning around 180 degrees at the end of uh, the platform, uh, will never have a, a discontinuity in terms of curvature. And this, of course, avoids the introduction of uh, um, extra, um, let's say, disturbances. Uh, on top right, you can see also the... Um, You can see also uh, the two um, treadmills, one side by side, with the smaller one present connecting them so that you have a gap, gap free surface. Um, below, uh, you see another view. You see also the size, the lateral size of the treadmill was uh, 40 centimeter, and then you have um, one centimeter of uh, length. These are uh, I would say uh, 10 centimeters yeah, 10 centimeter of size, more or less. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So, uh, and then below you see a um, uh, disassembled part in which you can uh, recognize three, only three uh, treadmill on top. You see uh, two direction plus x and minus x. So it was decided to uh, move the whole change which will support the 25 treadmills, in fact, with four electrical motors. Uh, two on one side and two on the other side. Now, it's very critical 
that uh, the, the torque produced by these motors should be coordinated, both for preserving synchronicity. If one, one chain goes at a faster speed than the other, of course, this will destroy the connection of a number of treadmills uh, between the two. Uh, the other, the other uh, aspect is the tension that we like to uh, provide on the top surface. So we would like, imagine that this is a kind of a long sheet, we would like to keep the sheet in tension above because this guarantees that the feeling of the user is that of a uh, rigid surface so that we could walk without oscillating or putting into oscillation this time. In order to achieve uh, this type of behavior, uh, there is a switching between the four uh, controllers of the uh, four motors. They are connected with a local uh, bus, a field bus, which is called uh, a CAN bus. And for instance, we, when we are moving in the positive x direction, uh, the actuator labeled with a, a 1, so actuator 1, will be the master. While the actuator on the other side, uh, in the same uh, size of the side of the uh, on the other chain on the same side of the platform, so actuator two will be a slave in the sense that there will be no cam mechanical cam connecting these two motors so that they are guaranteed to have the same speed. This is practically impossible because the length is is too large, five meter of distance. So the coordination is done digitally and. Uh, the, the motors are frequency controlled, uh, the command is sent to motor 1, and uh, the behavior of motor 1 is sent to motor 2 so that it replicates whatever motor 1 does, even if it's not executing exactly uh, the commanded speed, so that we have a coordination. While the other two motors are torque controlled, so they don't have a velocity profile, but they react to the tension of the chain, so that the upper part of the chain remain always in tension. Of course, when we switch direction from plus x to minus x, the role of uh, uh, these four motors changes accordingly. So this is a, a very important application, and you see that it, it belongs to the domain of motion control, although it's not an algorithmic one. It's the choice of the, uh, let's say, type of actuation system that you would like to impose. Okay, uh, this was more or less about the, the, the chain, what about the treadmill? And in fact there are 25 of them, of course you would like to use the same kind of actuation. And here there was a comparison made in the project between uh, sorry. between the uh, a choice of a hydraulic actuation and an actuation by an electrical motor. So on the first picture, you see with numbers uh, characterizing the elementary component, the typical uh, hydraulic actuation, which is being used, in fact, uh, for treadmills very often. This is below the treadmill. You can recognize an assembly so there's a roller uh, named with one, which is the one that goes in contact and transmits uh, rotation. This is why you need friction here. Uh, the hydraulic actuator is the number three, and you can see a timing belt on its axis, which uh, generates a motion for the side belt. Remember that uh, each treadmill has a, a larger part and a smaller part that should move at the same speed. And this is uh, guaranteed by the uh, timing belt that you see, number two. So there's only one motor doing the job. Uh, the other components are really uh, the part of the hydraulic actuators. There's a leakage pipe because you have a closed circuit for um, uh, liquid, flu for fluid, and high pressure. And so you have to um, make a, a full full loop between the source, the supply, the motor, and back return. Uh, the opening and closing of, uh, I mean, increasing or decreasing 
pressure, so producing torque, uh, is done by val valves that open subject to pneumatic commands, which are driven by electrical commands. In fact. So there's a, in a hydraulic actuation, you have fluid, this is why they are called hydraulic, but you have also pneumatic commands in order to um, give motion to the valves which open and close the circuits. So you see that uh, this type of uh, actuation was mounted for trial on some of the uh, treadmill. You see those are uh, the treadmill that are sitting below at this moment of the platform. And uh, you can see how um, all these components are accommodated. The other option was using uh, motors, electrical motors, in particular AC motors. Uh, sizing the component brought to the need of uh, motors that deliver 90 Newton meter of rated torque. They could reach the double if, in case of uh, request of peak torques for a few uh, instant of time. Uh, there was a transmission ratio of 1 to 10, so that uh, this is amplified by a factor of 10. Uh, as a whole, those motors, each motor of the 25, had a, a power of 1.5 kilowatt. While, uh, forgot to say, the operating pressure, more or less, of uh, the hydraulic actuation is about 30 bar. Now, there has been a, a comparison with this. Now, you see... Uh, on the right hand side uh, from the sketch, we see now how the whole uh, combination of uh, controller or motor controller uh, actuators and whatever is needed, uh, these are in fact actuators that do not need an encoder because they, they accommodate the, uh, their speed to the frequency of uh, supply. Um, now, there has been a comparison in terms of a number of characteristics. So, uh, these are general concepts. In fact, uh, you compare power density, and if you compare for the same amount of, uh, let's say, weight, of total weight of the object, of the actuator, what is the power, maximum power delivered? And in this sense, hydraulic actuation is much better than electric one. Dynamic range is quite similar. Uh, of course, electrical motor, there are so many types and uh, offers that they are typically cheaper than, than hydraulic ones, so this is a negative on the side of hydraulic. Uh, safety of operation is good for ele the electric, it's uh, quite bad for the hydraulic because of uh, a number of reasons, because you need a supply, an external supply that produces a high pressure and you may have leakage in the pressure circuit and so on. Synchronism are more or less the same. Maybe, maybe you can achieve a very good synchronism with hydraulic, but there's a three minus sign there. Uh, and in fact, this was one of the reasons why the hydraulic activation was discovered, because of the excessive leakage. Uh, this may be uh, due to the particular brand that was chosen, but in fact, uh, this was a good quality uh, actuators and still was uh, an excessive leakage in the circuit, something that could damage the performance of the whole system. Uh, the last point was that the behavior at start, if we start from, from a zero velocity and we, we like to reach as, much, as fast as possible a given velocity in order to cancel the velocity of the user, then electrical motor are better in this respect. So eventually, the final choice also for the treadmill, uh, just like for the for the uh, for the uh, chain, uh, went on electrical equation. So here you can see a, a few picture and also a video that I will let's start now uh, with the final setting. You see one of the four motors. This motor is much bigger in power, 9.7 kilowatt than the individual motor of 25 uh, treadmill. Uh, also, the rate of torque is more than 1,500 Newton meter. And in fact, uh, this type of um, actuators can 
let the whole moving parts, which I said is about uh, 7,500 kilogram, to move at a uniform speed of uh, 1.7 meter per second, which was uh, found satisfactory. In fact, more than 1.4 that was specified in the design constraint. Uh, on the right hand side, you see instead uh, a sensor which uh, reads, in fact, barcodes associated to each of the treadmill. So there are, each treadmill has a barcode so that you can detect which treadmill are below the platform and those need not to be activated. In fact, they can stop because in this way you reduce noise, you, you save energy, you don't need to put them in motion. And when they are getting closer to the top, depending on how the user is walking on the platform, then they will be restarted. So this is uh, one information needed. And let's see in this video what is the actual behavior. Here you see the uh, individual treadmill rotating at the end of the chain, and here you see a, a, a user walking on top, and below uh, you can see how things move. The, you recognize the, the motors uh, of every, of the single uh, treadmill in this view, and if you go on top, uh, you have a feeling of the height. And now you see uh, the barcode reading, even at a higher speed. And here you can recognize, this is uh, interesting also. Sorry. You can recognize um, with this opening part, the supporting structure which provides rigidity to the whole uh, system, so this blue uh, iron parts. Uh, you can see also the distance between one motor on one side of the left chain and the other motor on the other side, so you cannot put really uh, a long axle in between. This is why the synchronization should be uh, performed digitally. So, uh, let's have a couple of more technical insights, in particular on the behavior of the uh, cycloid profile. Here you see a uh, uh, simulation uh, when the platform goes back and forth. You see the linear part, the clotoid part, the circular part. And now if you get closer and the video will get slower, you will see how the presence of a, a side a small treadmill will accommodate the curvature, so without hitting parts. Now you see how uh, the uh, profile changes while you're turning. This is a view uh, seen on top, or better said, at the bottom of one of the treadmill, so that you would follow the treadmill while it's rotating around uh, the end of the platform because of the chain motion. And here is the final uh, mounting. In fact, these uh, last few seconds are taken uh, from the picture in, uh, in uh, uh, Tübingen where the platform was brought at the end and uh, was used until its uh, end of life, let's say, for many years actually after the project. The second video is again uh, summarizes a number of things. You will see how the first tests were made uh, already using some uh, uh, HMD device in Munich. The, the platform was not yet complete, but here you will see uh, the user moving uh, while the chain is rotating and while, of course, the uh, treadmill are in motion in order to compensate for the, for the uh, locomotion of the user. Then you will see how this was dismounted and in fact we need large trucks to bring the whole structure from Munich to Tübingen, still in Germany. And then you will see a uh, few uh, results I mean, few, few, uh, few results already. So this is the truck one of the two tracks. And this is again the mounting in Tübingen. This is below the wooden floor. Now the camera goes on top and here you see uh, one of the researchers 
walking on top, and here again the final setup. You can recognize at the, uh, in the video beyond is what the user is seeing in his head mounted dis display uh, the helmet with the localization uh, balls that are used by the Vicon system to localize the orientation of the head, and this orientation is used also. Or the, the position of the head is used also as a localization of the user on the platform itself. You can see that the platform in its final uh, destination was reduced in size. And this was just to avoid that the user could reach really the border and maybe trap with his feet uh, between the platform and the supporting uh, wooden floor. So it was reduced enough and the user had um, um, a hardness to protect him from falling, so this is a safety issue, it's not strictly needed by the system, but in order to do the test we had to um, wear this, this uh, harness. And at the same time, uh, if for any reason the user gets really close to the border, uh, before it may be uh, harmed by some uh, uh, trapping of the feet uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on this small hole there, uh, the harness would uh, suspend, uh, would prevent to reach in that configuration. So limiting, limiting in fact, the uh, workspace of the unconstrained wall. But of course, this is a limit case because the platform should compensate for this motion before the user really uh, reaches the border of the platform itself. So, uh, when we set up the whole uh, architecture, um, we can recognize the main drives, the four drives, they are of the Lenser type, uh, as a brand of uh, uh, servo drives, and these are used in this combination master-slave frequency control and the other two motors torque control for moving the chain. Then you have 25 belt drives, one for each treadmill. There's an underlying barcode. All communication are through the field bus of the CAN type. There are also uh, other interfaces, other channel, serial, serial uh, ports uh, with uh, RS232 or 485, which are typical of industrial uh, application. Also the possibility of connecting through USB. And finally, there's a control system, let's say I would call this more a human-machine interface, uh, including also a joystick through which you could move manually in the two directions the uh, platform, so you can move the individual or jointly all the treadmills uh, and or uh, moving the chain so that you could make some tests, let's say manually. Of course, this was not used in the, in the final situation, in the final operation. So, uh, let's see now how we get closer to the design of the controllers for this platform. So, this picture is pretty much similar to the case of the cyber carpet. What changes is the system that we use for localizing the user. In fact, here you see one user with its helmet, with uh, the set of balls that are used for localize the pose of his head. So, there are minimum four Vicon, so there's a Vicon system which localizes the worker head, so the position of the worker for what matters the platform control. Uh, there are information from the barcodes, the encoders, whatever you have from the platform itself. Uh, this two information gets into the platform controller and which gives command, which are linear commands, either uh, an X command, let's say, for the chain, or a Y command to a number of um, treadmill, which are those typically located around the position of the user. Uh, as before, whatever commands we give so that we move the platform and accordingly we move the, the user, this information should be, uh, let's say, separated from the intentional motion of the user which is the only one which characterizes the update of the visualization in the head-mounting display of the walker itself, himself. 
So same situation as before. What changes is that we have to give linear command. Remember that the first small platform was able to change also the orientation of the user. Even a, a still standing user, while recovering uh, the center uh, through motion of the platform, in the normal case, uh, the user orientation was being changed. In this case, this platform is not able to change in any sense uh, the orientation of the user. So only the user intentional orientation is uh, something that is not under our control. So we control only the position, uh, the linear position along the x and y direction. And we do this, we could do this with velocity commands or with acceleration commands as we have seen already in the previous case. So, uh, the control principle is the same, but now pay attention to a small variation here. So we have the walker, walker and platform it being localized uh, in some point x, y by the Viking system, so the actual position is measured, uh, not the orientation at this stage. So not the fact, it's, I mean, the orientation of the head is measured. But in fact, this has nothing to do with uh, the orientation of the walk or the fact that the walker is changing uh, direction. Indeed, there could be some correlation, but I could walk in one direction. Uh, let's, let, me, uh, let me come back here. I could walk in this direction, and I could walk in this direction while looking on the side. So the information on my intentional direction and on orientation of my head are completely decoupled. So this is very important to uh, understand. Still, we may use some information about the orientation. We will see this later on. So we send commands uh, which are either of the velocity type along the x, so along, let's say, the uh, uh, chain direction, or along the y, the direction of the uh, treadmills. Uh, for doing this, uh, we collect both the actual position, x, y, of the user. We compare this with uh, some reference. So, uh, the position x, y is being compared uh, with some reference position. This reference position may be the center of the platform, but also a different point, as we will see in, in a few moments. Uh, together with this feedback action, we have also the possibility of introducing the feedforward action. And of course, it would be a feedforward of the, uh, estimating the intentional acceleration or intentional velocity, depending on uh, which level we would like to design our controller. And for doing this, we use both the commands that we are sending to the, to the platform and the current position measurement. So remember that for us, the intentional motion, either if you represent it by a linear velocity or by a, a linear acceleration of the walker, it's a disturbance for our system. If there were no such motion, intentional motion, then we would not need to anticipate the intentional motion of the user, we would simply bring the user to the center, and this can be done uh, in a feedback fashion. Okay, so uh, let's do some modeling, very simple modeling in this case, uh, like we did for the uh, non on platform, but here the model is quite uh, elementary. It's a second order linear and decoupled model in the two directions, x and y. In fact, this model can be used in one direction, let's say the x direction, the direction of the, or the x1 direction, or the, whatever you can call it, so the direction of the treadmill, or in the direction of the chain motion. In any case, why it's a second order system? So let's uh, characterize these two equations. We have x dot equal v. On purpose, I neglect the presence of an index here. And then v dot equal ac plus aw. What are these quantities? 
x is the position of the user, is the absolute position as recorded by the Viper in the given direction. And this is in fact measured. Not only measurable, but actually measured. Now, uh, v is the derivative of this position, so it's the user velocity, pay attention, is the absolute user velocity, which results both from its intentional motion and the motion inherited because we are moving the platform. So, because there is a part of this which is not known in advance, the intentional part, and because we don't have a, a, an explicit sensor that measures V, so this is not directly measurable. Of course, we can reconstruct this with pretty much conventional means. The second equation is the evolution of the absolute velocity. Of course, it will evolve either because there's an intentional acceleration of the car, uh, sorry, uh, intentional acceleration of the walker, or because we are commanding with an acceleration the car, particular in, in, the, in the given direction. So both contribute, we can have, in fact, both of them at the same time, and they will change uh, in time the velocity, so giving uh, an acceleration, an absolute acceleration to the user. So these two quantities, AW is the intentional user acceleration, this is again not measurable, while the commanded acceleration is something we know because we have decided how, which command we would like to give, we would give to the platform itself. So if we have two directions, let's call it X and Y, or one and two, whatever you like, so either if this is a, a kinematic model of a linear treadmill or of a 2D omnidirectional platform, like the final cyberwork platform, uh, what, what, what we will say now, what applies in both cases, just by looking at one of the two controller directions. Okay, so in, in a sense, let's start for simplicity to consider the one-dimensional linear treadmill. We will repeat then the same consideration for the other direction. So, we drop the index i, as I said, so this is a 1D analysis from now on, without loss of generality in a sense. So, since we have uh, x dot equal v and v dot equal ac plus aw, so our control is an acceleration, and this is good because we already included some smoothness to the behavior of the platform. We, we have already commented on that for the other uh, side of the world platform. So an ideal or very simple command would be to cancel the intentional acceleration, if possible, so minus aw, and then to stabilize the system by damping out the total velocity of the user and adding a proportional term to the error between the actual position x and the reference position. Since everything is linear, this type of controller, if it could be implemented, so at this stage this is just a nominal control law, would uh, bring the error with respect to the reference position exponentially to zero in a stable fashion. So, pay attention, this reference position is the one with respect to which we are uh, regulating uh, the actual position of the user. So, uh, we will see in a moment that if we have a linear thread which is 5 meter long, which is, let's say, 5 meter long, let's put my hands on this list, so, it's obvious that the reference should be in the center. In fact, this is not the best choice for a number of reasons. Whatever, wherever we put our reference position, not necessarily at the center and not constant in general, this controller will be able to bring x to x reference with an exponential transient which depends on the choice of the gains, in particular kx, but also kv, which is the damping term of the uh, absolute velocity. So, uh, this is the idea, very simple control. However, this is not implementable as such because we don't know 
a w, and we don't even know, or we cannot measure, the total velocity v of the user. So the sum of the velocity induced by the commanded acceleration of the platform and the one induced by the intentional acceleration of the work. So, uh, so we need to design some observer. And these observer are designed in a pretty much similar way than we have done uh, before. Both are treated, are designed as disturbance observer. Pay attention, in principle, uh, the estimation of the velocity could be made with a partial state observer. We are in the linear domain, so we could use a Bloomberger observer or a reduced uh, order observer uh, to estimate, uh, to have a, an estimate of V which uh, has characteristic of uh, convergence, exponential convergence for any behavior of the velocity V. The problem is that the velocity V is influenced by a disturbance itself. So in the model that we copied, typically in an observer, of the behavior of V, we should include also a quantity which is an exogenous disturbance. This is why we prefer to treat this as a disturbance, just like the intentional acceleration AW of the Walker is, and we design two separate observers, one for the Walker acceleration, treated as a disturbance, and one for the total velocity of the, of the user, treated again as a sort of disturbance, but it's, a, it's something that estimates this value of B. And let's see what are the characteristics. So what we do, we, for the uh, disturbance acceleration of the Walker, AW, we make a copy of the system. The copy is a double integrator, so C1 dot. So C1 and C2 are the states of the observer. It's a dynamic system. And the dynamic of the state in nominal condition is a replica of the dynamic of the system, so double integrator, in the absence of the disturbance. So if the, uh, if the disturbance was never present, we would have C1 dot equal C2 and C2 dot equal AC, so AC drives after double integration the position C1, which is an estimate of which should be equal to x itself. Now, because of the presence of the, of the uh, disturbance at the acceleration level, we need to add some correcting term. Since we can measure only the position x, then the only thing that we can do is to generate an error between the measured position x and what should be a, a replica of this position, namely the variable c1. So we have just this error to work with, but we have two equations. So the idea is quite simple. We add this forcing term with two different gains, k1 and k2, and we hope that uh, these two degrees of freedom will be enough to make sure that the behavior of our observation of AW is, uh, is good, so that we have an estimate, let's say, A hat, of uh, w, uh, which is close to the real value of a w. Now, uh, in fact, the second addition in the second equation is really replacing the true uh, intentional acceleration of the walker. So we take as output of the observer exactly the quantity a w hat, which is this extra term k2 times x minus c1. So you see that it's uh, brought at the second order is the same concept that we had uh, for the other uh, platform. While for the velocity things are even much simpler, uh, we just have uh, uh, x3 would be the velocity without an intentional velocity of the user. So if the user is not moving, its velocity would be uh, zero. So we have a variation only because there is some error between uh, the actual position 
and the estimated position with this other observer, so the state of the observer is C3, so we have an error in general X minus C3, and we force the evolution of this because our position is not what we are measuring because of the velocity of the user. So this term, which should not be there, in general, but it's there, is exactly our estimation of, of V. So it's our V hat. So equal to K3, and this is the third parameter in this uh, two observer, uh, times the difference of the measured position and the state of this second observer. Now, it's quite intuitive, although this second uh, choice is uh, very simple. Mm -hmm. So, if we analyze what happens, and in particular, what is the relation between the transfer function, because we are now modeling things uh, in a linear domain, so we can do Laplace transform, and if we do Laplace transform of the observer, taking into account also the original state equation, which are uh, of, uh, linear of the previous slide, so we easily derive the relation between the true intentional acceleration and the estimated acceleration by the observer. This is a relation in the Laplace domain, so between the Laplace transform of these two quantities. And you see that the first equation represents a stable second order now system with unitary gain. If we set S equal to zero, so at steady state, in a sense, when the acceleration is constant, then after the uh, transient, uh, so for T sufficiently uh, large, uh, the limit can be computed for T going uh, to infinity, let's say, can be computed as uh, the limit of S going to zero, so with zero the denominator in the denominator of the S, what remains is K2 over K2, so one, so our estimate catches exactly the acceleration of the walker. We'll come back on this because having a walker which has a constant acceleration uh, in this special case analysis, of course is something which is irrealistic because if you have a constant acceleration for, let's say, 10 minutes, of course your speed has reached uh, a value which is astronomical. So this situation of constant acceleration, in fact, can be uh, realized also for few uh, instants of time. Pretty much same story for the estimation of uh, the total velocity of the walker. Uh, if we do the Laplace transform and we combine the equation, we see that uh, the estimation of V, so V hat, is a first order uh, low pass filter version of the uh, actual V. And if the actual V goes for any reason to a constant value, after a short transient, the shorter, the larger are the, is K3, uh, we have a steady state situation. We can set S equal to zero, and K3 over K3 is the unit, so the estimation catches exactly, matches exactly with the value of the intentional of the total velocity, sorry, not the intentional velocity. But remember that the uh, part of this velocity is coming from our command. So if we have an estimate of the total velocity and we know which, which part of this velocity is uh, uh, commanded by the control of the platform, well, the remaining part is exactly the intentional velocity. And this is a very simple consideration that we can use later on. So what do we do with these two estimations? We look back at the previous nominal formula, and we implemented an actual feedback law, which is still of the linear type, using also, uh, say, a feed-forward part, which needs not to be projected in this case, because it's exactly in the direction where we have actuation. So instead of cancelling the true intentional acceleration, which is impossible, in say for special cases, as we have seen, we are cancelling approximately the intentional acceleration by its estimate. So we subtract a hat of w. Same story, in order to damp out the total velocity of the user, 
absolute velocity, we used the estimate v hat in place of v, while the rest of the controller was already uh, implemented. So this will be the actual control law that we design. Pay attention, in this control law there are a number of parameters, all positive, but that needs to be tuned. In the control law we have kx, so the gain, the proportional gain to the position error, and kv, so the term which damps out the velocity, the absolute velocity, and in the two observer we have three more gains, k1, k2, and k3, which should be positive, otherwise you will have instability, but of course uh, you would like to find the best compromise between a rapid transient in the observation errors and the fact that you are amplifying also measurement noise and whatever is non-ideal in your system. So you like also to have a limited bandwidth of your observation uh, dynamics. So what is missing now? How do we choose the reference position? Now, I said, in principle, we could have a, a reference placed at the center of our platform. In the 1D case, this is at the center of the long treadmill. So if you have a, a treadmill 5 meters long, at 2.5, you set your zero, and this will be the point where you would like to bring back your uh, user. This would be the X ref zero, in a sense. However, the idea here is to use to modify this reference position, so the point where you will bring the user, as a function of the intentional or the estimated uh, intentional velocity of the wall. Now, as I said before, we are estimating v with v hat, but this v is the sum of the intentional velocity of the user and of the commanded velocity, which is the result of the integration of our acceleration command to the platform, so we can compute this. So if we make a difference between the v hat and the commanded v, so vc, we have an estimation of the intentional velocity of work. And we have also an, an estimation of the acceleration, by the way. But this is the most simple way of doing this computation. So we can use this within a function that needs still to be defined, which is a, say, monotonically increasing function with the estimated Walker velocity. So the larger is we, ha we had W, the larger will be the value of S of F we had, but at some point we saturate this because we don't want to bring this reference position too far away from the center of the gap. So for instance, a typical uh, scaled saturation function that we can use as S function is the arc tangent. And so the arc tangent, uh, the larger we become v hat, uh, the maximum we can reach is a plus or minus one. So this reference position can go uh, in one or the other direction of the platform of the center of the platform. And we can scale this with another constant, k ref. Of course, this is a nonlinear function introduced in the picture, but you can locally linearize this around the zero and replace it with uh, k ref, directly the uh, estimated velocity we had for analysis purpose. For implementation, you can use the saturation function as such. Now, uh, w w what does this function? Why, why uh, we are changing the reference? So, when the user moves forward, and the faster he moves forward, so the higher the speed, the more we are changing the reference, and the reference is it follows, in part, this motion. So, we have a situation like this. If the, robot, if the walker is standing still, so it's intentional, velocity is zero, and the estimate of this intentional velocity may probably be zero or close to zero, then we don't move the reference. We keep it at the center. Now, suppose that the walker starts walking in one direction and achieves some speed. Then we will move the reference uh, forward so that 
he could, at, at steady state, if it has a constant velocity in that direction, the controller will bring him back to this reference position, which is not the center of the planet. So the user has less part of the platform in front of it, of him or her, and a larger part in the back. If the walker increases his speed, now this is an idle case of running, but let's say has a, a more rapid steps or larger steps at the same frequency, so the estimation of its intentional velocity increases together with the intentional velocity effect. And this point is brought farther and farther in front of it. Of course, the saturation is needed because we don't want to bring this reference point too far away or even beyond the limit, the physical limit of the platform, of the treadmill. So you see that the higher is the speed, the more space on the back the user has. And this larger space is used because when the user abruptly stops his motion, then we have, uh, we can accommodate with a low, lower acceleration is recentering, having, uh, let's say, the possibility of having a longer overshoot in the transit. And this will be quite clear in the experiment that I will show later on. So, this is the idea of modifying this reference is that when the user halts while moving at a certain speed, there will be more space available to stop the platform motion without exceeding uh, upper bound on acceleration commands, which are the perceptual constraint effect. And of course, this works in one direction, but it works also in the other direction if the user changes direction at any time. So, uh, at this point, the final Control scheme is the following. We have the platform, it's a 1D platform, or it's one of the two directions of the omnidirectional platform. And uh, we have a position which is being measured. We generate a command which is an acceleration. If the platform received only velocity command, we integrate this value. Or we integrate this value for our needs, for instance, for reconstructing the intentional velocity of the user. In any case, the command that we have generated in our observer is the acceleration command is being used together with the actual position of the worker as measured by the Viking system. And we have the two observers that generate A hat, W and B hat. And this together with the value of X ref, which is being updated according to the estimate V hat of the worker, they contribute with, uh, to the generation of the command the acceleration command in that single direction. In the controller, of course, there are a number of gains that should be optimally tuned, not in a random fashion, because we can associate to each of these gains some interpretation of what is its role in the transient. K1, K2, and K3 are related to the observation. Kx and Kv to the position error. And the non-zero uh, total velocity that we see when the user is in fact not at the center, uh, because not at the uh, reference point, because when it's there, the platform is moving at the same speed, and the total intentional speed is in fact zero, because we have canceled completely by the velocity command of the platform, the intentional velocity of the user. So, uh, we developed the tuning procedure first for the actual one-dimensional linear thread, uh, which has electrical actuation. In this case, we had only one motor, so this is a more simplified version of what we had in the final 2D platform, where we have four motors. In fact, we have uh, two motors on the two sides of the, of the, of the treadmill, of the, let's say, of the platform. Here it would be of the treadmill. And one motor in front and one motor in back on each side of the chain. So we have a total of four motors. While this uh, treadmill is a much, much simpler one. It has only one motor for moving one direction on it. There's a reduction gearing, there are a transmission belt, there are a number of uh, issues, but essentially this is the main difference. 
from the control algorithm point of view, this does not change. This is more implementation issues of the technology of control. How do you translate a commanded uh, signal into uh, power current in an electrical motor that generates then torque and moves the uh, surface of the platform, including the work. So uh, here you see our experimental team. It was made by um, a researcher from uh, our group, from uh, Sapienza, from Max Planck, uh, from uh, uh, ATH. And you can also recognize uh, one of the Vicon camera on the right hand side. At the center, there is Mark Ernst, who was the, super, uh, the uh, project uh, scientific director. And here on the side, uh, so the platform that we use here is 6 meter long and 2.4 meter uh, of side, of width. And here you can see uh, a number of technical parameters of this platform. So the maximum velocity, you can run really on this, on this treadmill because it reaches 40 km per hour, so faster than the record length of the 100 meters. But in fact, by software, this was limited to 18 km per hour. Uh, it has also a maximum acceleration which can reach up to 3 meters per second square, so much higher than the final uh, uh, omnidirectional platform that we have seen, the two-dimensional platform. Uh, remember that we reached there 1.4, 1.7 uh, meter per second square. Here, by software, we limited uh, this maximum uh, acceleration to uh, three meter per second square, to one meter per second square. Uh, similarly, we could limit the jerk, so the variation of the acceleration in our command, so in a discrete time fashion. So every time we have a variation of command, it's a variation of an acceleration command. This variation divided by the sampling interval should be less than a, a limitation which represents a limitation of jerk. And we set this to 1.5 meter per second cube. So this is intended to give a smoother command to the platform so that the perceptual feeling is uh, improved. We extracted the position of the user via a icon. Uh, here, the data rate is much faster, uh, up to 120 hertz, so 120 measurements per second. Uh, I remind you that we had a, a rate of 10 hertz in the other system. Although, in that case, we were not using the icon, we were reconstructing uh, the position and also the orientation of the body of the user with the field, particle filter method, uh, which was much way more accurate, but probably excessive in that case. Uh, the limitation here comes from the uh, update rate for the commands, which was limited to 30 Hz for the hardware at this, position, at this position that was available. So, in this context, we uh, tried out with the human walker uh, four different situations. So, the first situation was the user standing still, but out of center. This was the same situation that we did with the uh, cyber carpet, the non-ionic platform. So, we see how the platform will move to bring the user back to the center. Uh, the second experiment was uh, with the user moving approximately at constant speed, then halting, then starting again, constant speed, halting, and so on and so on. Of course, this was what we asked the user to do. And so the constant speed may not be exactly constant, but the halting may occur sooner or later with respect to a periodic behavior. But anyway, this was the intentional situation for the user. Uh, motion. And even more delicate, we ask the user to start at rest, to accelerate, keep for a few seconds constant speed, and then decelerate uniformly to stop. So a trapezoidal profile for the velocity, if possible. Again, 
it would be, you will see that it's an approximation of this type of behavior. But this was what we instructed the, the user to do. And finally, random walk. You know, random walk to test the general performance of the platform. So I have video only for the last part, but uh, for the last case, or random walk, but I have uh, results collected here for you. Uh, this is, sorry, I think, okay, I don't have the standing steel, but the standing steel was not really a problem. So this is a situation where the walker uh, starts at rest, walk at constant speed, then stop for a while, then start again walking, keeping as, as much as possible a constant speed, then stop again. And here you see uh, on the top left plot, you can see the actual position of the user and the variation of the reference, the reference position, which should be at zero if the user is not working. In fact, at the end, it returns to zero. Or when the user stops, is in a halt position, it goes back to zero. But what happens when he starts working? So he has an initial acceleration and then proceeds with a constant speed. And the reference position goes in front of the center of the platform, but a bit beyond where the user is. So the user, uh, at some point, continues to walk at that, uh, at that speed for a few seconds, and then stops. At this time, you see that uh, the actual position of the user goes across the zero, so it Pass all passes over the center, it goes back almost two meters, and then it's brought back to zero. And all this is made by limiting the acceleration and limiting also the jerk. So the old transient is uh, available because we set the reference in front of the zero, so the reference was at 1.5 meters, so that we have 1.5 meters more to be used for bringing back to the center with limited acceleration the user when the user suddenly stopped. So it has a deceleration almost instantaneous. So this explains more or less the behavior and the same story happens uh, afterwards. It's also interesting to see the second plot where we uh, draw the, the estimated intentional velocity. So it's the VW hat, in a sense. And you see that the walker did uh, quite a good job because it walked at a constant speed of about 1.5, 1.4, 1.3 meter per second. Then it stops. There was some uh, small transient uh, for the estimation. And then again, uh, started walking at approximately a constant speed. So you see that the estimation is really giving back uh, with a reasonable approximation because of the human in the loop here, uh, the behavior that was uh, instructed to the walk. Finally, uh, we see the velocity command that it's uh, uh, sent to the carpet. In fact, we generate an acceleration command and we integrate this because the low-level controller of the platform was accepting, in this case, only velocities. So you see that the profile of this velocity is rather smooth, so there are limitations in the derivative of this, which is the acceleration, and even in the second derivative, which is the jerk. We are sometimes sensitive also to large, to large jerks in our uh, stability condition. Uh, this is, a, again, another uh, profile which relates to, uh, let's say, a trapezoidal behavior. So the user was commanded to start, accelerate, reach a constant speed, stay there for a few instants, and then decelerate constantly until stopping. And this is, in fact, more or less what the user did or what we were able to extrapolate as estimated velocity. So we have an 
increase, there's some uncertainty around four seconds, then continues to increase the estimate, reaches a top value, stays there for four to five seconds, and then uh, decreases uniformly uh, till second 25, where then uh, the estimation goes to zero, as does the intentional velocity of the user. And the actual position of the user, you see that uh, he increases his position, so it goes in front, uh, close to the uh, front boundary of the, uh, of the platform, but he's moving at 2 meters per second. And so uh, the reference itself, it follows him, but at some point it saturates, so it does not really follow him uh, completely. And then when the velocity uh, is going back to zero, the reference is going back to zero, but you see that there is some undershoot, so the user, while uh, uh, in the process of stopping, uh, is brought up to one meter beyond the center of the platform, uh, and then again back to uh, zero. There is some residual error here. I mean, there are some data which are not really uh, ideal, even in this case. So, let's see uh, a video now with the random walk. This is uh, Paolo Rubufo Giordano, at the time uh, a postdoc in our lab, who contributed to this, uh, uh, to this project, and now he's a senior researcher, he's a uh, director of research at CNRS in Rennes, in France, and he was uh, used as a, uh, te for testing, huh? for testing this random walk. So this is a video, again, you see that he's wearing the helmet. The helmet is uh, for his localization. You can see on top left part a red uh, circle. This is exactly the, uh, one of the four Vicon camera that's projecting also infrared uh, signals so to localize better the balls that are mounted on the helmet. This information will be later used in order to update the visual data on the head mounted display, but we use it here also for localizing uh, where the user is. It's in fact, uh, let's say, uh, overruling the situation. It's, it's a very accurate measurement. We don't need such an accurate measurement. But since we have to do it anyway, we are using the same information that the visualization part of the system is using. So let's see uh, what, what happens. So you will uh, understand I think better also this idea of a reference position and what happens when the user suddenly stops. So you, I don't know if you can hear also the noise of the motors, of the motor, of the platform. And you see that now it's a constant velocity. It's not exactly at the center. It's a bit in front. Now it's a speeding up and of course the treadmill is speeding up as well and now it stops and you see that uh, the platform does not stop abruptly otherwise he would have given a push in a sense unbalancing the wall but in fact uh, the centering was reobtained after some trend. Remember, as long as Paolo is walking, now you see that uh, the deceleration was very slow, so we used up almost all the platform. And if we didn't have a reference in front, then we would have needed a larger acceleration in order to uh, stop the treadmill and then recover uh, centering of the user. Okay, I think that this is uh, quite enough at this stage. Uh, I would say that this is the right moment to make a stop and then reprise.